to begin with, can you say your name and the year you were born? Oh, my name is Duyen Pham, and I was born in 1952 in Hanoi, Vietnam. And to begin with, can you help us understand your life at the, um, in the early 1970s? Could you describe your life? In the early 1970s, so the year I just finished my high school, secondary school, and where my father was working as the clerk in chief of the justice court. And he's also a French teacher in the high school there too. My mother was just a housewife uh, looking after the children. And we live in a nice house provided by the government. And until 1974, I finished university with a Bachelor of Art in English. And also, I was attending one year in the faculty of pedagogy to become the secondary school teacher. In, yeah. my, my sister, I had one sister, and two, one older sister and two younger sisters. And I had uh, two, three, three older brother and one younger brother. But uh, the oldest one died uh, because of sickness, right? Um, so, so we just don't mention that. But uh, even though it's really very sad, but uh, after that, my, my other two brothers, um, they were on working for um, just like a military trooper. My older brother was working in Zilin, so very far from where I was living. About, yes, uh, he was a military reporter for uh, military security force. So that's why even though he was just a candidate officer, not high rank, but uh, he was also in jail for almost seven years after 1975. And a military, of, a military reporter, reporter. Is a, a writer, a journalist? Writer, yes. For, for he wrote military. for military security force. And my other brother was um, a surgeon for uh, Navy, yes. And so we had to, uh, so I live in dorm with my sister, right? Because of my father, my mother, and my two other siblings in, in the, still very young. So they still stay in uh, Vĩnh Bình. After that, we moved to Bình Dương. So also live in the house provided by the government too. But in 1974, I finished uh, university. My sister finished in 1970 when I started. And she worked as a high school teacher in Saigon. And she was also a reporter for Saigon Broadcasting Station, hosting one of the most popular programs back then. So it's called the Queen Zhao Hours, uh, broadcast from 7 to 8.30 p.m. every evening for um, soldiers, yeah. South Vietnamese, yes, soldiers. And your university was in Saigon? Yes, I was attending the last year, just like, uh, I was about to, to finish the, my, um, my last year at the Faculty of Pedagogy to become a teacher, you know. But I already finished my bachelor in 1974. So it means after 1970, we had a very lovely, nice, even though the country, I know, it was very sad at the climax of war, but uh, we were lucky to live in the cities in safety. So very grateful for South Vietnamese soldiers, you know, who sacrificed themselves to protect our homeland so that we could go to school, had a nice life. Change after April 30th, 1975. April 30th, 1975. The Republic of Vietnam collapsed, and the whole country, ironically, you know, the whole country before that was divided for 20 years, 
and after 1975 was reunified and the war ended. The war ended in the situation to my family. We called uh, the country lost, home gone, no country, no home. So my family was hit the hardest. One of the millions of families in South Vietnam, you know, it's just like a universe shocking tsunami to South Vietnamese people because it changed 180 degrees. Because you can imagine, after that, my brother was in jail. My father was lucky because he, he was a teacher and he just applied for retirement a few months before April 30th. And we moved in our own house in a hurry, just because I think beginning of 1975, everybody already felt the situation. And everybody, the chaos and the land day and day lost to the communists, day and days, weeks and weeks from the central, after, because the Vietnam was divided into two parts, right? And after the latitude, 17 latitude, the, the land of freedom of South Vietnam was invaded by communists, by North communists. And we lost our, we lost our land pass by pass, so everybody was panicked. Everywhere was in chaos by the beginning of 1975. Your, your father, he was a clerk in a court. Clerk in chief. And then he's also a teacher? And he was also a French teacher. So the lucky, you know. And he's just retired for a few, a few months before that. So that's why we moved in the new neighborhood in Saigon without anybody knows, without the, and, and after that, my mother too overwhelmed with the worries and fear. So she was, she was very, very sick and died a few weeks after that. When we had a short time of reunion, before that we had a nice life time. But everybody was far away. I was in dorm, and my sister uh, just got married, and um, she got married just uh, two years, you know, and uh, live um, um, separately. And right, uh, I think right one day before April 30th, she gave birth to the second child. And my mother was hospitalized a few days right after that. And my father was devastated. So, and after that, my mother died a few weeks after that because uh, with all kind of disorder, disorder and dysfunction of the organs in the body and unexplainable. Just because I know that just because before, a few months before that, everybody was almost very, very panicking. When, uh, because I major in English, you know, so all my American, British teacher professors at the university were ordered to get out of Vietnam by beginning of March. So at that time, we already knew that. But uh, my, my brother, far away, and my, and I had an uncle who's deputy mayor of Vũng Tàu, a very famous resort in South Vietnam, you know. So he already told us to get ready. What was life like for you after 1975? Between 1975 and 1985, when you, uh, what was life like? So I, because I, suddenly I was a student with all the hopes and know nothing about life. Everything looked after by my parents, suddenly. So the whole family, um, no income because uh, I, we had a decent life before that but we were working class middle class but we had to work 
everybody is working. And right after that, uh, some people in jail, and my mother untimely death, the untimely loss of my mother was the most uh, tragic, you know, because it's so sudden, so unexpected. I am, but lucky, you know, because uh, my 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 mother's younger daughter sister, we can't end, you know. Uh, she was working as a cellist. She played violoncello for the National Symphony Orchestra because she was the only one in the family, in my mother's family, who stayed back in Hanoi after 1954, when the country was divided, you know. Because at that time, she was 17 years old, and she was a musician, you know. She was trained, and she loved music. She was heartbroken to leave her musical instrument behind to follow family, to immigrate to the South. So she chose to stay back to, so that not to leave her musical instrument. Because at that time, everybody thought that the country was divided for two years only. But uh, it turned out uh, 20 years in war and very, very uh, fiery war with millions of people, the death of millions of soldiers, you know. And um, so, so it's, life is uh, ironical because uh, 1975, the country was reunified. And the, the new regime, they they say that, oh, now is the happiest day because now the country was uh, reunified and now we have a complete independence. Uh, and they claim their credit independence from French colonies and now independence from the uh, new neo colonies of the US, you know. They claim on the credits. And they say that, oh, okay, but. My family was devastated. With the so your mother died, and you had a brother in jail. Yes. A brother who was a military reporter. In your jail. father did not go to jail because he was. He was very retired. sick because he retired. First, he was retired. And second, even though he was retired, he's supposed to be in jail at that position, you know. But he was lucky, he was a French teacher. And my aunt came in time. It came in time to say goodbye to my mother, you know, because she was in the orchestra, you know. So he was one of the first people from the north to come to Saigon. And instead of to be happy to be reunited after 20 years separation, but instead just to say goodbye to her sister and, and to see the family devastated. So she, so she said that. And so my father was devastated at the loss of his wife, and uh, at the and the mm, and all his colleagues were in jail, you know. And even though some people retired or they changed their career, they stopped working for government, but they but their identity showed that they used to work for the former government as a government official. For this, for that, you know, they were still put in jail. So they live in, it means, uh, heart-stricken. Heart-stricken, and after that, poverty-stricken. So he was really very sick. So that's why he was, uh, he was uh, uh, es escaped from being in jail, you know. Just lucky for him, and lucky for us. But uh, I was suddenly, as a student, I suddenly, I became the person who had to look after the family. My three younger siblings, you know, and the youngest only 11 years old, in poverty. So I just cried days and nights. Were you working? No, at that time, you know, my education was garbage. And they said that, oh, this is a debauched education and everything they burned on the books after April 30th. All the books had to be burned. All the music had to be thrown away. And, uh, and the money, they, 
in the bank, you know, they, they took away from all the money, whoever had the saving in the bank. So we had, so we had to sell everything because the whole, the whole South Vietnam, I think that a lot of people, except some very rich people, you know, or business people, they had nothing to do with the government before, and now they they could hide their money, they could hide their their gold, their diamonds, for example, you know. So they they could have us okay, but uh, I think uh, as a uh, government official, uh, civil civil servants, students, we were we were hit very very hard. When did you decide to escape? When we were hit by that, you know, actually before 1975, we already wanted to escape because we know that from the magazine uh, Time uh, and um, American magazine, you know, the whole country was red, was occupied by communists. So we want, we, and my family immigrated to the South when the country was divided. So we were one of those who wanted to flee the country as soon as possible. But how could we? How could we? And you know the chaos of the situation. So maybe everybody knew on, through the media you know how chaotic it was. So and after that, when the new flag was raised, so we were devastated. So we know that, oh, so the we had to be victim, ill-fated victim of the new regime, but uh, no opportunity. And after that, I, as a final year student, we had to study one year of Marxism, one year philosophy of Karl Marx, of uh, Lenin, Stalin, you know, and uh, on the uh, uh, ideals of communism everybody and we know that they call educated people just like um, they they say that this is a, a revolution and if we didn't learn that we didn't go to school to learn the philosophy of Marxism so we were they called the anti-revolutionary reactors or reactants have you heard of that so it means uh, anti-revolutionary reactants. And how did you manage to escape? It's just like miracles, you know, because of my parents, uh, they had a lot of uh, good friends who were not um, government officials, who were business, uh, businessmen, business uh, people. So, and in 1978, when the country had the uh, um, the movement of uh, cross-border escapes, you know, because uh, they, we had the conflict with China and the government wanted to get the Chinese out of the country to, to let them go back to China because we were at war with China in 1978. So until then, so we had the, the waves of uh, escape you know, cross-border escapes. And my, and I was, at that time, you know, lucky for me, you know, first I had my aunt, who, even though he just came to visit, he had to come back to Hanoi. But uh, she was heartbroken at my shattering family too. And she thought that, she advised us, you have to do, after 20 years living with them, she understood how it was, she advised, had to try our own ways to get out of the country as soon as possible. But how could we when we had no money? But just lucky for me, lucky, I was the main person after that, you know, to my sister, very young, me. At that time, my, my, my education was garbage, right? So for the first year, with the support of my aunt, she was only as uh, just like a worker for the government at that time, you know. So, but uh, she had a huge heart. 
she shared with us whatever she could. And uh, I remember she brought some money to buy a piano because right after 1975, you know, the people from North Vietnam, you know, they came to the South. Everything to them was really very precious. Uh, they had no television, they had no radio, they had nothing over there. So when they came to Saigon, so everything was valuable. So we had to sell everything to trade for food for the first year, you know. And after that, uh, we had some, uh, some jewelry from my mom, you know. But for the first year, you know, nobody wanted to buy until the day when we have the money, the currency exchange, you know, with the new money of the North or the communists. So on that day, some people, I, I always ask my, everybody to, how to sell, my, to trade for food, but nobody could do it until one day, because they already knew, but we were stupid, we didn't know. So one day, I, 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 I could sell one drink, and right after that, many people came to ask, me whether I had anything else to sell. I said, I have just uh, two more, and I sold them. Right after that, the next day, the currency changed. So it means, and everybody was allowed to have only uh, 100 Vietnamese dong. It means uh, a few hundred thousand uh, Viet, uh, South Vietnamese money before, you know. So my God, I, I cry like uh, being murdered because uh, we live in poverty, and now when I wanted to have it sold, I couldn't do it. And now, when I just sold it, we had the currency exchange. Just like we lost everything again. I cried like being murdered because I was responsible for my family. My father was really after that he he was heart stricken and uh, and malnutrition, the whole family in malnutrition, you know, so he was very, very sick. And on top of that, I had to, sometimes we had to visit my other brother in, in jail. They call re-education camp, but actually just in jail with torturous labor, you know. In 1981, I had the chance, for the first time, I had the chance to escape. I, because before that, I did. But I couldn't do that because of my, I had to wait until my youngest sister reached the age of 17. I think to me the minimum age to be without me, without someone to comfort, you know. And at that time, because with the help of my aunt, she was able to enter the school we call the kindergarten teacher's training school, you know. So when we entered that, so after that, after finishing, you had a job right away to teach kindergarten in Saigon. So that's why, so I think, so one more year, she was able to be on her own, even though we continue to live in poverty, you know. But uh, determination, because after so one year studying Marxism, for the first few months, I think that I was unlucky, my family was unlucky. But why I was so selfish? Now the country was reunified. And uh, before we live in decent life, we live a decent life just because we were lucky. But a lot of people suffer from the war, suffer from uh, living in poverty. I, we were just lucky. And now it's our turn. So in 19, 1981, you said that you had your first your first real opportunity to leave. Yes, you see, you see, because uh, living in such situation, we were blocked by all kinds of distresses, by all kinds of difficulties, emotional, financial, um, psychological, and the future, no hope. We are living in the dark tunnel of sorrow and pain. So I was determined to escape. But until um, 1981, when my youngest sister was 17 years old, and uh, with the help of my parents' friend, because I was, they, they thought that I was English teacher, so I could pay back their money. So they, so they gave me the chance 
and in 1981, I was, I had the opportunity, but unfortunately, it was unsuccessful. I was put in jail, and uh, I was sent to somewhere, a uh, camp uh, to do hard labor, you know. And um, by miracle, my survival, you know, my existence in this life, actually my whole family survival, has been made possible by miracles. So by miracle, I survived uh, that trip. So, but uh, because uh, it's a lot of detail, I so still lucky I survived. And I came back after six months to do hard labor and through all kinds of hardships and all kinds of dangers, you know. So I was lucky back home safe and sound. But uh, just like another change in, in my mind. But uh, my determination never, never changed. So 1984, my, I had another chance by my parents' friend too. But uh, suddenly, when I was about to embark on that trip, so I was given the opportunity by my benefactors, uh, whose name is Nguyễn Vinh Tôn. I called my angel, you know, and his brother, Nguyễn Quốc Chu, who was the captain of paratroop of Republic of Vietnam, you know. And um, so uh, we had the, it was so very unexpected. So that's why so I, so I changed my mind. I didn't go on the trip organized by my parents' friend. So I took this trip, you know. So this is beginning of the horrific but miraculous trip. The, the horrific but miraculous. That's why I'm here. Otherwise, I could have uh, been buried in the ocean right on that trip. Benefactors, they were living in the United States? They, at that time, they were living in the United States. So, so everything arranged uh, and by them and paid by them, you know. And, uh, they were friends of the family? Uh, friends, uh, uh, not my family, but my, my students. But because I was, at that time, uh, after 1978, I had a chance to do my job, you know, to come back because at that time English was in great demand because uh, first the government re realized that uh, they need English. But before that, they forced everybody to study Chinese and Russian and no English, no French. But after 1978, when we had the, the ways of uh, cross-border escape and hardly official, you know, half official, because they're organized by the government themselves. They want to, to, uh, to take money, uh, to take gold from the rich people, from the Chinese people, you know? And, uh, the, and so a lot of Vietnamese who were rich, they were disguised as Chinese in paper to escape the country. But uh, after that, you know, so that's why English was in great demand. And, uh, so we had the, my, my parents' friends help me so that I can pay them back if I escape. Even though my family, no money, no gold. But we were lucky to get help from parents' friends, from students' friends, you know, who had the connection with the, um, with the trip, you know. And this trip, the trip, I survived and that marked the milestone of a new episode of my life, you know, started on September 23rd, 1984. Tell me about that trip. It's uh, seven days, it's seven days, but uh, it's five days audio, you know. So it's really very um, miraculous and unforgettable. So, to begin, so 4 a.m. on September 23rd. So, 
after praying before the altar, the family altar, to pray to God for a successful and lucky trip, blessed with good, uh, no encounter with pirates, because that's the most important to me. Because at that time, I was determined. I would rather die than leave, uh, continue to live a life with no dignity like that for my whole life. I determined. So at that time, I prayed to God for my father, for my grandfather, my grandmother, and my aunt, my siblings, you know, uh, good health. And for myself, so good luck with the trip. The worst scenario is the death. So I chose death in the ocean. But uh, I prayed to God. Of course, I prayed to God. Hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. And the worst is the death in the ocean. I was determined. So, but I pray to God, uh, if my family was destined to get to the dead end of the worst fate, I would rather die in the ocean than in the hands of the pirates. And then for exactly 4 a.m. You were by yourself? Yes, because uh, it's very expensive, you know, and very hard. And besides that, we had to take care of my father, who's sick and who's old. So do we know? So that's why I, I, we, I could go by myself, even though I wish my whole family could go with me. And where did you leave from? Because the, at 4 a.m., so through the window pane, I, I saw the, the lights from a motorcycle flashing four times. So it was a signal I was told before someone could came to pick me, you know. So I just follow that. And then I, um, so I sat beside the motorcyclist, you know, and uh, I gently opened the door without any sound. But 15 minutes before that, I worked my, my aunt, the only one who knew I was leaving because it was very, very dangerous to to keep, you have to keep the, the escape very sec secret, you know. Otherwise, you you could be caught any time. And uh, so my, so 15 minutes, I, the whole night I couldn't sleep. I cried the whole night. Before leaving, I I was, my heart was filled with nostalgia and love for everyone I will have to leave behind, you know. So I try to be calm to say goodbye to my aunt who couldn't sleep, just had a few minutes left before that, you know. But the whole night, she couldn't sleep either. And I myself, I cried the whole night, you know. And then at 4 a.m., I, I got ready at 3 a.m., but at 4 a.m. exactly. So I, I saw the lights flashing. So I opened the door and took with me a small handbag with a bottle, about one liter of water with some small souvenirs of the family pictures. And one a necklace in the shape of an eagle spreading the wing given to me by a long time friend. Because of that friend gave me, always wished me good luck. And I, I, I thought that that's a mythical meaning to me too, the eagle. It's my dream, the eagle, just like a symbol to help me to get to my dream horizon. So that's why I always brought it with me whenever I escaped. And then after sitting behind the motorcyclist and saying goodbye in tears to the small house where I lived almost 10 years in hardship and sorrows. And uh, so after that, he came to the west bound station bus station, another man, I was told that another middle man will help me to continue my, my trip. So at that point, another man with the black hat gave me a ticket. I didn't have to buy the bus ticket. We all, they already organized. So I just follow him to get on the bus and then go to another province, completely unknown to me. And when we got there, it's about noon. I was asked to have lunch with some people waiting already. 
So I guess those people could be with me on the trip. After that, we were asked her to get on the, to go, to continue to go and to another place and all to the ferry docks, you know, and then got on the very, very small boat called taxi. So the boat will take, will just take us um, to the big boat. But uh, that small boat, just a group of four or five people. And um, with a lot of food on the top as a disguise, because we have a lot of um, checkpoints along the river bank. So we had a lot of food, and we just lie underneath the food. And then when at the checkpoint, they just look, and then they let us continue. Around after, in the afternoon, um, so late afternoon, maybe evening, so we stopped by a bush by the river bank and waited for a few hours. And when it's really very dark, when it's really very dark, so they, uh, before that, they gave me a piece of paper with a password on that. And then we hid under the bush by the river bank. And when it's really dark, so the, the boat person who rode the boat continued, continued, and we, we continued to go smoothly until suddenly they stopped. And in front of us, a big boat rocking. So they call the big fish, you know, and everybody, everybody. Uh, I, I saw a lot of taxis, a lot of small boats surrounding the big boat. Everybody uh, was trying to get on the big boat uh, chaotically, you know. So the female and the children stood on the back of the male relative, you know, so that they can grab the bar of the big boat to jump in. I was very small, physically I was small and very weak. So, and I couldn't know how to swim. So at that time, I wanted to give up. I wanted to give up because I thought that, oh my God, how could I make it? Because uh, I, I don't know how to swim. And if I was unsuccessful to jump into the big boat, I certainly, I would drown. Because nobody to waste their time or, or with the energy to save me in the chaos like that and in the darkness like that. But uh, in desperate, in desperate, um, the, you know, hopeless, uh, desperate despair, I prayed to God, I cried. I said that I couldn't, I couldn't get my way back home either because I actually followed the man uh, took me to the province I never known before and now I couldn't get back the taxi, I couldn't give up. But uh, suddenly I, I was about to, dr I think that maybe I could dr drown right away or otherwise. So I tried my best. I prayed to Kuan Yin Buddha because when I brought with me a pocket-sized booklet of Kuan Yin Buddha incantational words just to pray for salvation, for protection, you know. So, and I try my best, jump high and firm. So just like my invisible power lift me up, you know. So I was inside the boat, the big boat, without the help of anyone. So I was so, so surprised at myself. But right after that, I was stepped on by other people continue to jump into the big boat. I said, oh my God. I would, tremble, I would be trembling to, to death if I couldn't stand up. So I tried my best with all the strength left in my body and prayed to Kuan Yin Buddha again for help, just to help me have the energy to stand up. So miraculously, you know, as if by magic, people continue to jump in and step on me, but I was able to stand up with all my, my effort 
and I stood right uh, next to the edge of the boat. Right after that, I heard someone shouting, you know, someone sh shouting, yelling loudly, stop boarding because uh, it's overloaded. One more person, it will uh, capsize and everybody will die right here at this river. So, oh my God. And, um, and right after that, uh, so the boarding stopped and the, they turn on the flashlights and they check the password of the passengers. So I saw some passengers were rejected. They said, that, oh, uh, these passwords not acceptable because we belong to Bacho group. We don't accept Bacho passengers. Oh my gosh. I, I, at that time, I didn't have any idea, but until when they came to me, I confidently gave, gave them my piece of paper. After reading that, they told me, oh, now please go back to the taxi. We don't accept the password because it belongs to Bacho. Oh my God, I thought that my ears, oh my God, I thought my ears just got uh, hit by a thunderbolt. Uh, how could be in, it possible like that. I risked her, um, my, my death, you know, my life. Uh, I, I was supposed uh, to, if I, I might uh, get drowned uh, when I try to jump into the big boat and now I'm with Mister. Certainly I would be in jail. So I begged them, I cry. I said that please allow me to stay on the boat because I was, I was so, you know, so, so sad, so, and so panicked because it's impossible. Certainly, I would be in jail if I was dismissed. But uh, whatever I said, to no avail. They said that no. And two men were ordered to carry me, one to hold my head, one to hold my legs, to throw me back to the taxi still waiting around the big boat underneath. So my, I, I said, oh my God. So my bitter tears were all over my face. So I said, oh my God. So I would be in jail, it's inevitable. But uh, just suddenly the flashlight uh, uh, turned off and uh, maybe they got the signal and the boat Head it, head it to the front at full speed. And the two men who were just carrying me, you know, put me on the floor again. I was amazed at what's going on. I thought, oh my God, what happened? Just like a just like miracle, you know? Because I thought that I supposed to be in jail. So this is just like my miracle. I was put on the boat, and now by medical, I escaped jail. I escaped being put in jail. So I was amazed and so grateful to God. But right after that, you know, and they, they checked password, and after a few hours, um, after a few hours in darkness, they darted to the ocean. And after a few hours, cheers w were heard. They said, oh, we get to the international waters. We are safe now, out of, we, we out of the danger, you know. So I burst into tears because I said that from that minute, you know, I could be truly away from my family, my beloved one with, without any clue when I could see them back. So I, I cried. And even though I was very, very grateful to God and relieved, but I cried so much. And after that, they continued to, the organizers, the boat owner, they continued to harass Bacho passenger. They asked everybody who belonged to Bacho had to give them because or otherwise 
they would throw those people into the ocean. I don't know whether they had the heart to do that, you know, but I was so panicked too. So was relieved uh, because of now out of Vietnam, get into the international waters, but now harassed by the organizers. And when they came to me, I begged them, I said that. I had nothing. Please allow me to stay. I owe you a debt. I will pay you when we are resettled. So I, I don't know how about other passengers who didn't have uh, anything of valuable, you know, valuable uh, value. But uh, to me, I had nothing. I just have a tiny gold ring given by my aunt, but I, I, I hid it in my bra. I couldn't take it out in the middle of the boat like that. So I begged them, and luckily they let me on the boat. And then the, uh, the night came, you know. So, and um, the next day came. So everybody was exhausted and relieved because of hoping that in a few days we will get to the refugee camp. But uh, the next morning, they gave us, everybody was thirsty and hungry. And the owner and the organizer, they give, uh, it's the, they give uh, each passenger one teaspoon of water. And they said that, uh, one teaspoon of water now, and then another teaspoon in the afternoon, and that's it. Everybody was surprised because before the trip, they promised again, again, everything for survival looked after by the organizer. We don't need to bring anything for the safety, you know, and for the, because they don't want the weight of the boat, you know, to be overloaded. So they didn't allow us. And, uh, and now they give each passenger two teaspoons for the whole day. One given in the at noon time and one given in the evening. Oh my God! Everybody is so surprised and nervous, and then wonder why. And they explain because right now, for some reason, the health the official healthman was not on board. So now, the health the aide you know the healthman aide does not have experience to navigate the route in the ocean. So we have to depend on the good luck. We just have to let the boat drift with the ocean currents until we are lucky enough to be rescued by any ship's bus bite. Oh my gosh. So now in my mind, you know, everybody looked so scared. And, and at that time, I was so panicked. All the gruesome stories came to my mind because some both lucky to, to get to the refugee camp safe and sound after a few days. But a lot of boats unlucky drifted at sea for weeks and everybody died from dehydration or from starvation, you know, and some boats, you know, I was told that from the news, you know, just like they, they, they all died, only except a few people survive by eating the flesh of the dying passengers. It's just really very horrible survival. So, and some boat, unlucky, attacked by Thai pirates, and the women were raped and abducted, and maybe missing forever, or of course, that. So a lot of gruesome story in my mind. I was so, so sad. So I was struck mute, you know, with terror. But what could I do? Just pray to God for protection and for safety. And uh, after that, the night came. I was so thirsty, so exhausted, and so happy to remember I brought 
one little bottle of water. So I was happy to take them out. And I thought that if I, I was given, I would be given two teaspoons, and now I would have my two teaspoons from my own water, so maybe I can survive for two more weeks. But uh, after that, one, after one sip, I didn't dare to have it. I wanted to, to, to drink the whole bottle, you know, because I was so thirsty, I was so tired. But just thinking of survival, I just tried to have one sip. Right after that, a group of three people begged me to give them the water. So I thought that, oh my God, three people. So it would affect my survival badly. I didn't know what to do, but, but uh, thinking they ask, they need water like I myself. So I give them, I said, that, please, one sip, one person, please. But after they gave to the third person, they didn't give it back to me. They just lie around, or oh, one person uh, uh, just took it. Because I was exhausted, you know, so I just closed my eye. I didn't know what I thought that they would give me back, dry after a few seconds. But after that, and after that, they turned rude. They dared me to take it back. Oh my God, I was so sad, so upset of my stupidity, my inability to deal with such kind of people. But I knew that, oh my God, right from the beginning, right from the beginning, everything was in chaos and was at odds. So certainly a lot of hazards on the way, a lot of other things happening. So I just pray to God to calm myself down and for safety. And then the second day on the ocean, it means the third day of the trip, the crisis began with a 15-year-old girl in front of me, fainted. She, uh, she's too thirsty. And the mother back. Oh, please, anybody, please help. One sip of water will help my, can save my, my daughter's life. No response. Because everybody remember what the owner threatened before. Because the, the boat was too crowded with more than 100 people, you know, and it's a small boat. So they said that the rules have to be followed strictly. Whoever stand up or move around to ask for food, to ask for water, will be thrown into the ocean. So nobody dare to move, nobody dare to ask for anything, even though we were exhausted and thirsty. But she's right in front of me, very pale. I couldn't pretend not to see that. And I said that one sip of water could save her life. So I tried my best to crawl up the stairs, to look for the owners, to look for the organizer. And they looked at me angrily. I said that, no, I don't ask for the water for myself. But one girl was fainting. And she might die soon without water. So luckily, they went down and gave her a few spoons of water. So after a few spoons of water, she regained her consciousness. So her family was so happy, and so was I. And then we live in that. So the next day, with the leave situation, with the same thirsty, hungry, exhausted, and I I had headache with the smell, terrible smell of vomit, of stool, of urine from the children around, you know, because the situation of the boat. We have only one toilet area in the back, and the boat were jammed with the people sitting next to each other, very hard to move around. So I was exhausted. So I was, but, uh, and when the sun was very intense, burning, you know, very hot, I, I guess it's noon time, you know. So the girl fainted again for the second time. 
So I try to beg for water for her again. So the second time, on the second day, so they gave her some water. And she was recovered again, like yesterday, like the day before. But it's my turn. I was exhausted because uh, it's so hot. And just two spoons for one day, you know. And every day I had to drink a lot of water. So I was about to faint. I couldn't see anymore. And suddenly, you know, as if by magic, the rain came down from nowhere, and a few raindrops just revived me, just like the mag magical water from the bottle of Kuan Jin Buddha, just revived me. So I was revived from a few raindrops, you know. The boat owner tried to get the raindrops with all kinds of container, you know. But after that, because the, the container contained the oil, the, the engine oil, you know, very black, very smelly. And now, so the water, nobody could drink. So we just like continue to be thirsty, just like no water again after the rain, you know. So, but I was lucky. I had, I got a few raindrops, so I was revived. Otherwise, I could have died, you know. So, and then, after that, one man, they has the idea for survival. They collected, he collected the coconut uh, peel from the boat owners, you know, they thrown here and there on the boat. So she, he collected and peel off peel off the, the husk, peel off the, the outside, our layer, outside layer of the coconut. And we have uh, the inside layer. So we, we suck to have the moisture from the coconut. So it held, it's bitter, but it held to moisture your throat, you know, or otherwise your throat's burning because from dehydration. And I couldn't, and you couldn't swallow anything. I brought some food. I wanted to trade with some people, but nobody wanted to. Because I know the boat owner, they had the, the water. I want to trade with them my food, you know, but nobody wanted to. I just need a one sip of water. And luckily, I was revived by the rain. So I think uh, I just want to be to be short, because, uh, okay, so for the next day, when the sun was burning again, so the girl fainted again. But uh, unfortunately, this time, the boat owner refused to give her water with the excuse that everybody should be treated fairly. And uh, within half an hour, she just murmured, water, please give me water. And after that, unbelievable to my eyes, he got a big hiccup and then he shut her eyes, her body completely motionless. So, so her, the mother panickingly say, oh my God, save, please save my, my child. She's dead. The boat owner hurriedly came down, but uh, hopeless. And she would never need water again. So after that, she was ordered to be buried in the ocean. So I, nobody, the boat owner asked anybody could stand up to perform a very short uh, ceremony, but uh, nobody did. And uh, for many years living in tears, I always prayed to God for protection and for help. So I always thought I just stood up to do the prayers in my silly way, but just solemnly. 
and then her body was thrown overboard. And so everybody, the whole family, sobbed heartbrokenly. And already was very sad. I myself couldn't hold my tears, mourning the innocent girl sitting in front of me for five days. And now she's had to say goodbye to have an eternal lonely sleep in the ocean just because of the unkind organizer's broken promises. And then the next day, so, um, but after that, you know, uh, a very, very mysterious phenomenon never, I never mm, experienced before. So the engine stopped uh, completely and the panicking voice asked for help. Anybody need to uh, know how to fix the engine? But uh, completely, the boat uh, stood still. And uh, after that, uh, many people run around just because uh, of uh, uh, with the weird looking and soulless eyes, you know, very, very, uh, very strange phenomenon. And then uh, the people just murmur the same as uh, the, the same words that written in the name of the girl, you know, who, uh, because I was the person who, who volunteered to burn the incense and to do the prayers. So that's why I know her name was Tuyen. So the words are repeated from the weird looking people and the boat owner had to shout uh, angrily. Everybody had to sit down and stay still, otherwise uh, the boat capsized and we would die right here. So the phenomenon, and right after that, uh, the girl sitting next to me became pale and we are looking like uh, the other people and also say the same word. And very, very um, unexplainable. I didn't know why I didn't run away. I didn't run away from, the, uh, uh, from that girl and make uh, chaos like other people. I just looked straight at her eyes and said solemnly, Tuyết Nhiên, as a good girl, alive now, a good diviner when you are dead. So please help your mother and your sibling and forgive the other bad people who didn't give you water. And now bless everyone here to get to the shore of freedom safely. So mysteriously, you know, a few minutes after that, uh, so the girl came back to normal, didn't know what he, what she had acted or said a few minutes ago, and the engine started again. So very, very unexplainable phenomenon. And then the next day, so I think uh, some boats uh, floated up and down. The boat owner had to burn the clothes uh, just as the emergency signal to ask for rescue. But uh, the boat, the boats came closer, closer, and and kept uh, far away. No boat, no no boat. Um, nobody, uh, they all disappear. You know, floated up and down, closer, and then disappear again. So disappointment after disappointment. And then suddenly uh, one big boat came closer and closer. So everybody was happy and thought that maybe we would be rescued. And uh, one big throat was thrown uh, to our boat and to have it tied to the big boat. And I heard the same. Um, someone whisper, damn, the Paris encounter with them means death. Oh my God. So I quickly look at them. I saw five men jump down and stood on the floor of our boat. Or oh, everyone with the weapons in their hands, one man with a gun. And they all have a 
darker, sun-stained complexion with hairy faces. Oh my God, so I knew that. I, I was panicking. I prayed to God right away. I said, oh my God, I always pray to God because if my family was destined to come to the dead end of the worst fate, I would rather die in the ocean than in the hands of the pirates. But God, my, my, my prayers was not answered, was not accepted. So am I about to, to, have to be in my doom now? Am I about to my doom day? So I, my, why, I, I say that, why? Um, so I, so they, they check everybody and took away anything valuable. Uh, just me, I had nothing of interest, you know, but a lot of people. And then four, four men, every man gave on the spoils that they just got from the passenger, you know, to give it to the one man with the gun. So I thought he's the leader. So he, he took on the spoils to come back to his boat. And uh, other four pirates just kept watchful eyes on him as if he wanted, they wanted to know where the spoil would be hidden. So usually I would say that as weak, as a snail, as slow as a total. But at that time, you know, I was panicked and I thought that my mind was blown away, my limbs were falling apart, and I wanted to be far away from them as far as possible, because even though the boat was only 10 meters along. So I prayed to God, and I took the opportunity, stood up, and darted down to the, to the end of the boat, and uh, sit down swiftly amid the angry whispers of other passengers. Oh, this old woman wants to die. Oh, this young, this little girl wants to be thrown into the ocean. But uh, right after that, you know, the helmsman threw me a piece of engine oil and said that two lighters red on your face right away. So uh, I spread the, the oil all over my face and my limbs and the other girls beside me uh, also said in a hurry, please give me some lumps of oil. And the handsman continued to give them the other lumps. Right after that, the four pirates turned back and yelled in their language. But uh, we understood that uh, we had to be stopped noisy, you know. But luckily, you know, the leader was not back yet, so four of them continued to to keep uh, themselves busy um, watching the leader uh, in their boat. So, um, but, uh, and look back right after that, you know, just miraculously, you know, I was in front of Trinian's mother again, after being displaced uh, uh, by the uh, chaos when the people uh, run away, from, when the embodiment of Trinian spirit uh, in the, some, a few pe persons. So luckily, she instantly, she gave the, her youngest toddler, uh, the infant about one or two years old to me, and said like a, an order, like a command, um, hug the girl tightly. And the other girls beside me, you know, wanted to grab the, the toddler out of my arms. But she said firmly, um, stop it. Um, this is my, my child's biological end. So that's why uh, the other ladies um, stopped uh, rapping the girl. Right after that, the pirates were too furious. So they pounded the wasps toward the noisy area. And in no time, uh, I was wrapped by one man with the dagger in his, in his hand. So the toddler screamed loudly. 
and uh, learn to be more tightly. So, so the the guy gave me a quick and angry look, uh, seeing the dirty woman with a child in my arms. So made this made her made him relent a little bit, and then after that, he released the grasp of me. So enjoy the other guys to look for other women. So in a few minutes, five men already uh, took five women, uh, young and good looking, uh, who didn't have enough time uh, to put the oil on their face. And they dragged them to their ship, ignoring the helpless resistance and the desperate crying for help of the girls. And with the backing of the family's relative. And uh, they, they banged their weapons down the floor of the boat and ordered everybody to be quiet and shut up. And then the, they, the ship further and further away, but I was traumatized. I didn't know whether I was really alive or I was just uh, uh, dreaming. So, but uh, and uh, right after that, you know, I, the panicking voices of many men, oh my God, scoop the water out because, uh, scoop out the water because the water leaked in from through the homes created by the pirates. Oh my God. So I came back to, to, uh, to reality. I was alive, but now, the boat had to encounter with the new problem, um, the possible sinking of the boat. So everybody was panicking, and all the men and boys scooped the water as fast as possible with all kinds of containers given by the boat owner. So everybody was so, you know, hopeless and lived in terror the death flickering closer and closer. And uh, it's just like uh, the late afternoon. And from far away, while everybody was so, so sad, so terrified, uh, so the luminous lies from far away, from a high, tower, just like a big castle in the middle of the ocean. So everybody shouted, oh, the oil rig, the oil rig. Uh, mm. So we, I, I thought that, oh my God, I was in a dream again. It's illusion again. But uh, the louder voices from other men so assured me that, oh, this is the reality. I was not in illusion. So, so everybody and all the men wanted uh, to, to row, to scoop the water out, uh, and uh, to row the boat to the, because the, the boat was uh, damaged, you know. And uh, they tried to, to row the boat as far as possible. And then in a short time, uh, we went closer to a big, 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 a giant ship to us with a big sign, uh, Panama. Oh my God. So everybody was happy. And then I passed out because of too exhausted from the panicking moment, you know, when we encountered pirates. So after a few, Mm, a while, you know, so I was awake, I was quickened, and in my confusion, I recognized the sailor of the Panama ship. We were given some water, and I heard uh, mm, that's uh, oh, uh, one lieutenant of the mm, Republic of Vietnam, you know, already t uh, came up to ask the captain to rescue. But uh, he was refused. His request was rejected. And now another lieutenant colonel 
was talking to the to the captain about that. And just a few minutes later, the colonel came back with the bad news. The captain refused because uh, uh, he was on duty drilling petroleum in Malaysia. He didn't have any facility to rescue a, a big group of people like this. I was so happy when I, a few minutes ago before I passed out because I thought that I escaped from that, I would be safe. But now, with the bad news, I was shocked again. So, uh, right after that, I heard one young man shouting, there is um, one English teacher on our boat, uh, Miss Yuen. So where is Miss Yuen? Where are you? Why don't you come up to ask the captain to rescue us? So I, I guess this kind was the brother-in-law of uh, Mr. Nguyen Quốc Chu. So um, he calls, I and Kang never met each other, but he was told to look for uh, the English teacher uh, whose name is Zin um, on the boat uh, to help her because uh, to help me because they know that I was weak, you know. So everybody was uh, excitedly shouting, where is Miss Zin, where is Miss Zin? But I was too exhausted, no energy to say anymore, to say anything. So I just raised my hand and waved it weakly. So two men hurriedly came to me and one hold my head, one hold my legs, carry me um, to up the rope ladders, you know, not the regular ladder, and put me on the floor of the Panama. So one doctor came right away, and a group of the group people um, came around me after about, and they gave me something, some liquid, I didn't know what it was. And the doctor checked um, and gave me the oxygen and checked my lungs, checked my blood pressure. After about 20 minutes, uh, with the fresh ocean air, I felt much better, as if the magic uh, medicine uh, in the fairy tale that reversed death to life. And uh, so I was able uh, to answer the question from the doctor clearly, and I asked them to help me to stand up to talk to the captain. So after talking to the captain, just a few sentences to ask him for help, he shook his head sadly and he said that two men already uh, talked to him about that, already requested him to rescue, but uh, he's sorry and he explained why he couldn't do that. Uh, first, uh, he was chewing petroleum. Uh, second, we had a big group, very difficult for him to help. And he already gave us a compass and water and food, uh, so enough for a few days uh, to continue on the trip. So he said that, so, and I, 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 I begged him to listen, to continue to listen, to tell him what happened to our boat. And I told him everything, so it means that no helmsman, with the, the boat drifted with no direction for a few days, and one girl died from dehydration, and five girls were abducted. Uh, by pirates and the boat was damaged by the pirates and now in the danger of uh, sinking. Um, so any time, uh, so he said that, but now you only have a compass, he comforted me. But uh, thinking of coming back to the boat uh, with smelly boat and with the people uh, starving and uh, now confronting the uh, sinking, the possible sinking of the boat, so that's enough to die. So I said that, okay, my, it's this. I was, uh, sup I have, so it means my prayers were not answered by God. But uh, I, in death, in, so I pray to God, continue to pray to God. And I was so, 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 so sad. And um, I felt so desperate and hopeless, you know, and continue to pray to God. Uh, why you let me die when you save me from danger after danger during the past five days and now you let me die in the ocean at the moment when I was most hopeful for, for the 
my dream came true and for the end of the danger, why, why, I asked that and shouted in my mind, you know. And um, I said that um, I have a two, I must stay alive. I'm the main artery of my family. So thinking of my elderly uh, sick father, my young sibling who has suffered so many years and now will be more mm, painful with the, my death. So in ultimate desperation, I look up at the captain and beg him for the final time in the choking voice. I said that, uh, Captain, if you determine not to rescue us, so on behalf of more than 100 people, I would like to bid my final goodbye because I believe that the minute I'm leaving here to come back to that unlucky boat, all of us will die in the sea because the boat was damaged by the pirates. How can we continue to go? We will never have the opportunity to be rescued by any other boat, as you said. Goodbye, Capstan. So after my desperate, tearful final goodbye, the captain was really moved, so he asked me how many people, uh, how many women and children. I said that I don't know, but uh, less than the number of male passengers. And he said that in my condition, I, we could try to rescue all the children and women who are at the highest risk of dangers. But um, male passengers continue uh, the trip on their boat and they will be rescued by High, high United, United Nations High Commissioner boat. Um, so patrolling around here uh, come to rescue. Oh my God. I said that, oh my God. Uh, the captain changed his mind and uh, I, my, I'm saved from death. I, I'm not dying anymore. So, uh, Oh my God! So I say, oh my God! I just want to shout out loudly. Oh, thank, thank you, Captain. Thank you, God. Thank you, Wooders. And um, it was right after that. So I, the two men who carried me, you know, still standing there, anxiously waiting for the decision of the captain. I told them that the captain could only save the women and children. They were so happy enough, you know. So they shouted out to the passenger on the boat. They said, the captain could only save the women and the children. And then the, um, the, the sailors were ordered to get down to the boat to help bring the children and the women to get on board the Panama. So after that, only 50 people occupied a very small area on the vast, spacious, steady ship, you know. So only a very small area. And the people began to say goodbye to their relatives. I don't have, I didn't have any relatives or friends on the boat. But uh, at the tearful parting of the families uh, who were with me during the past five days, uh, witnessing on the dangers, went through on the horrible incidents, I felt heartbroken because this is uh, not like a temporary separation, but might be a very eternal separation because to me, there's no hope. Uh, who understands? the instruction to steer the boat in the direct, um, in the correct direction, you know. And the boat will be lost again in the middle of the ocean. So, and maybe, and what happened when it was already damaged? So I tried, I thought that maybe I'm, I, what can I do? I thought that maybe the captain was the only one who can save them. But uh, what can I say when he already refused so many times and now am I too much 
a tool and in appreciative of his generous kindness. But uh, looking at the people and they saying goodbye, tạm biệt ba, tạm biệt con, you know. So it means by father, by dad, by brother, uh, take care in uh, and crying. So it's just like a, a collective a funeral. So the captain, so I beg, I beg the captain again, please forgive me. Uh, I'm very grateful for your rescue and saving the women and including myself. But I think uh, there's no hope for the other people on that boat. Uh, please save them. We don't need clothes, we don't need food. We just need a small spot to stand on the land of life because that boat is the zone of death and this is the land of life. So maybe the captain was already moved by the sobbing of the tearful uh, parting of the family and the goodbye uh, words, you know, because even though he didn't understand in a strange language, but uh, his eyes shone overwhelmed with emotion and he nodded. So signified that he agreed to rescue everybody. So the two men stood beside me, shouted loudly, the captain agreed to save everybody. Oh my gosh. So everybody, so one by one, stepping on the rope ladder to get on board with the confused face and uh, fear, the exhaustion, you know, still on their face. So on, on board. So we were asked to stand to have the head counted. So after, after counting, so 137 people, including children, women, and men, a few minutes right after that, a unexpected storm thunderingly came from nowhere, you know, with the huge waves spilled, uh, over spilled, uh, over spilled uh, the, the high floor of the Panama ship. Yes, overflow. Yes, yeah. And uh, we were, uh, and after that, you know, the, the water pouring, the rain, you know, thunderous rain pouring down. And uh, the, the crew's men had to uh, throw the big rope to tie it together to the big pillar of the ship so that we wouldn't be washed away to the, sh to the ocean. And um, we were, everybody was shaking in the cold, you know, with the gusting wind uh, struck right, directly right onto our body. So everybody was shaking in the cold. And just in a few minutes, the big canopies was spread out to cover us. And uh, the tiny boat, a few minutes before, still not far away, you know. Um, because after the last person came on board, got on board, and after the week out, so the boat was cut, uh, were chopped off uh, to uh, uh, not tied uh, like uh, not tied to the ship like before, so were chopped up and was uh, drifted away slowly. And now, in front of us, of course, many people as thought it didn't didn't see it, but uh, in front of a few people, you know. So the tidy boat a few minutes before, with more than one hundred people on board, now submerged and emerged submerged, immerse, and finally disappear under the pouring rain and with explosives, thunders, and lightning across the sky. So we were all shocked and 
it means that 137 people lives were just saved by God it's miraculously. I was struck mute uh, again and again, one after another, with amazement and terror. So I escaped from the danger. I witnessed the miracle so many after the few days. And from that moment, you know, together with 136 people, I was brought back to life from the zone of death by the miracles of God, by the compassion of the captain. The miracles were embodied. By the miracles were embodied through the captain's compassion. I was saved from the Paris, from the Paris through the compassion of Titian's mother, the health man. So it means that my life was saved miraculously. The miracles were embodied through human beings' compassion and love and kindness. I just and then the captain after that, you know, we were invited to get inside and to have the shower and we divided into groups to have the shower because we didn't have enough uh, the washroom for everybody. We are in groups of five, six people, men with men, women with women, and, and then were invited to the dining room and all the we thought that we had a feast from the Aladdin's um, lamp, magic lamp, Aladdin in the fairy tale. Because uh, after the five days starving and coping with the deadly incidents, you know. So we were rescued by Captain Brian O'Connell. At that time, we didn't know the name. But uh, after two days, I was allowed uh, to sleep in the one separate room, but uh, other people slept uh, on the floor of the, of the Panama ship underneath the big uh, canopy. And at night time, at that time, uh, we, uh, the, the storm already stopped, uh, but still the raining. And we stay on the Panama ship, so two nights and one day. So after you were saved by that Panama ship, Panama ship, where did they take you? So you say it's just like um, up on the second night when I was sleeping soundly, and um, one the sailor knocked on my door, knocked on my door. And um, they say that the captain waiting for me. So it's at the dawn on uh, September 30th because uh, we were saved on September 28th. And uh, after two nights staying on the Panama ships, uh, so the captain on, at dawn time, very early that morning, so he nailed down when the sun was rising up and uh, he knelt out before the sun. And after that, he, he told me that, uh, uh, th thank God, uh, that gave you the opportunity, uh, gave you, asked you to give me the opportunity to stay 137 people. And after two days waiting, I couldn't contact uh, any United Nations ship because of the impact of the powerful storm. So now we ourselves had to weigh the anchor to take you to the refugee camp. So on that day, so we left. Uh, the, the anchor was weighed and then we were taken to the closest refugee camp, Pulau Bidong. How long were you there for? I was there for four months and yes. How did you decide to come to Canada? Because at the um, refugee camp, you know, uh, we 
everybody had no choice. We had to wait for the delegation from different countries to come and to accept people. And I was lucky. Uh, first of all, you know, because uh, I worked as an interpreter at, at the Pura Bidong. I worked as an interpreter for high commissioners and for different delegation too. And uh, I just the applicant as the other applicants to apply when other when any delegation came to the camp to accept the refugees. So I was rejected by the U.S. Uh, delegation because they have their own policy, uh, and uh, so I applied for um, Canada when they came. How was it decided that you would come to Toronto? Oh, I was um, sent to London when I first came to Canada, not Toronto. I came to Toronto in 1988 after my marriage, after I got married. You know, so during three years in London, I was a newcomer. But uh, I worked right away as a part-time translator. But because I was a newcomer, so it was very complicated. I didn't have a car, so they gave the job to another person. And I wanted to go back to school as soon as possible so that I can have a career. But I had to uh, no hope because uh, I was not a resident. And um, so I, the government gave me a six-month course to learn how to become the bartender, way, you know, food and beverage service, and hotel management. And in the first few months, I was just like an alien. I did because in my life, I never, I never drank any alcohol. I didn't know anything about uh, uh, spirits, alcohol. And I learned to be a bartender. So you know, everybody told me, okay, no, you, this is not your place. But after three months, I try to understand and to learn the books that they gave me. So at the final exam, I was the only one who got the 100% mark after many years. They said that nobody finished the course with that mark. So they called me an alien. And with that certificate, you know, and uh, so I was the only one to finish the bartender course with the mark 100%. And so I got the, uh, the job um, easily. So uh, I, I, was, I worked at the, as a garden, a Japanese garden, uh, as a waitress and a, as a bartender. And uh, in the daytime, I went back to school. I was lucky to be accepted by Western University uh, to take uh, two courses only about 12 hours in the morning. And so in the afternoon and evening, I worked as a waitress. And on, um, so I was the only full-time waitress at that store. All of them were students, university students, you know. And so I, uh, I had one day off, and one day off on Friday, I worked part-time as an unemployment counselor for women immigrants in London. So, and then in 1988, Mm, I got married. I moved to Toronto, and I was lucky I, to get the job as to come back to my teach, uh, teaching job. I so I got uh, um, so I now I'm retired after 28 years working for Toronto District School Board as an ESL instructor. What? were the obstacles that you faced as during your integration? Obstacles, I don't want to say obstacles, but I think uh, difficulties and uh, challenges a lot, a lot. And But uh, obstacles, no, because this is a very, very multicultural society. And they give you the, the opportun opportunities as long as you work hard and you make effort. But uh, challenges and difficulties, yes, a lot. What helped you in your integration? My jobs, my jobs, most helpful in my integration. Because I had, as a waitress, at first you see it in the, in the class to become a bartender, they said that, oh, I should uh, be kicked out. Uh, it's a waste of time, a waste of money. But finally, I finished. 
and um, and then uh, as job, you know. So I learned a lot. I learned so much uh, from the Canadian society because my whole life I was just student, student, and after that, uh, uh, coping with uh, living in jail in Vietnam, living in the refugee camp. So. So my first years in Canada, it's just like uh, the learning time. Uh, so it's, um, it's very, very meaningful and very helpful. I learned, I wrote personally and professionally. So I really appreciate, I'm very grateful to everybody that I, I met in my life. How long did it take for you to feel at home in Canada? It took me very long. I, I, because I'm the only one to leave my family behind. And, um, and the, even though I worked right away when I first came to Canada, you know, and I was in school, after that I found a job, I was on my own and independently, no longer get a government assistant after six months when I came to Canada. But uh, the culture shock you know, so it's because um, I, even though I was a translator and an interpreter at the refugee camp, and I worked right away when I came to, but uh, it's still my ESL. It's not uh, native speakers. So I many times I felt like an um, outs outsider. And uh, I was so lonely. And I, so you can imagine seven days a week working. And, um, Go to, going to school. In 1988, I got married. And right after that, I, I had the first child. So, so very, it took me very long. And then, um, my, until my, my father and my two young sisters were reunited with me through my sponsorship, I felt much better. And my husband's family came too, so I felt much more at home. Even though I worked and I participated right away when I first came to Canada, but I always felt I was an outsider. When did you sponsor your family over? My family came in 1991, you know, because I saw, and until, and, um, they are all working now, and my own two sisters, my, my father already died 12 years ago. But um, I, the first reason when I wanted to escape from the communist government, because I wanted to live and my family live in dignity, I, I was determined either die or live in dignity. I couldn't accept that kind of life, you know. So, and if I live here, I live in dignity, but my family over there. So that's why you said home. Home is where your heart is, you know, you see? So that's why it took me a very long time until I felt at home. Forty years later, how do you feel about the life that you and your family have made here in Canada? It's, I'm so grateful to God grateful to all the my man, benefactors, my saviors, and grateful to Canada. I, I had a second life after I was saved miraculously, after so many deadly incidents. And, um, and I worked hard. Uh, you see, you can imagine, right? I, have a, I got married, I have three children. They are now on grown up. They have on their professional career after finishing university. And my wish my, to, to come to Canada to deny the, the communist uh, regime just because we wish to live in dignity and to help my family get out of the dark tunnel of pain and sorrow. My wish was fulfilled. So I so grateful to God, to Canada, to the United Nations High Commissioner for having held, protected, and sheltered hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese like me who fled their homeland 
to escape the communists after the fall of the Republic of Vietnam in 1975. How do you feel about Canada's humanitarian response to this or other refugee crises? Yeah, I think this very refugee crisis, that's right. But uh, my reaction, uh, my, 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 my thoughts uh, at uh, Canada's reaction was, I think, so humane, so generous, and remind me of the time in 1980 when Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, the father of the current Prime Minister, welcomed uh, 50,000 Vietnamese more people. So I think so. So the decision of Prime Minister Trudeau now touched my heart uh, deeply, and so grateful for that. And I think uh, it's completely in sync uh, with Canada's global image. Canada stands out like a very generous, caring, tolerant, and humane country in the world. And so, and Canadians are proud of that. So I think. Uh, the Canadians' um, humanitarian reaction now to the refugee crisis is completely in sync with uh, Canada's image. What can future generations of Canadians learn from your personal experience and, and, the, and Canada's Southeast Asian refugee program? I think uh, everyone sees and understands the world differently in their different ways and through different lens. So therefore, I dare not say that my personal experience can be of any lesson to the future generation of Canadians, but I'm willing to share my personal opinion with my children, for, you know, at least. You know. So I think the first, in my personal opinion, I would like to split that question into two parts. The first part from my own experience so some lesson can be drawn from different, um, different people, you know. But the first lesson, in my personal opinion, the lesson of compassion. Life needs compassion. My survival was made, has been made by miracles. And the miracles were embodied through human beings' compassion. And uh, in my personal experience of war, I think, uh, from my lessons, so we escaped communists, and communists invaded South Vietnam, where my family was living. We, they claim all kind of credits. Uh, they gained independence from French uh, colony or whatever, but uh, their reach, the brutality of them, uh, the merciless. Mm, mm, uh, rule. So that's why we had to escape. So Vietnamese can learn the lesson that we, mm, Vietnam was divided and we were invaded by the communists. And we had to flee our homeland to escape communist government. And uh, the second part, uh, the lesson from the uh, Canada's Southeast Asian Refugee Program, I think uh, is really a very, very um, humane. I don't know what to say because uh, that's, the, that's why I was accepted here. And I don't know how to, no words can describe my gratitude to Canadian government with that hum, humanitarian policy. So I think uh, as long as Canadians still pride themselves on their reputation uh, because of their country is a very tolerant, caring, humane country, so the future generation of Can Canadians should be proud of this program and should be appreciative and acceptive of the refugee. And uh, Vietnamese, and by the way, you know, I would like to add one more point about the, uh, because uh, this is also the new chapter with this program, a new chapter of Canada history was begun with the establishment of the three communities, 
Cambodian, Laotian, and Vietnamese. I don't know how, how about uh, Cambodian and Laotian, but the uh, Vietnamese community have been growing, have been growing into a very strong and productive, uh, productive uh, workforce, contributing our heritage to Canada's multicultural society and making it more spectacular. That's what my personal opinion. Maybe many people don't agree because everyone is different, you see. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. So I would like to take this opportunity to express together with hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese who fled our homeland to escape communists, you know, to express our infinite gratitude to Canada, to the United Nations High Commissioners for Refugees who had helped and sheltered Vietnamese people after the fall of 1975, the fall of the Republic of Vietnam, you know, and sheltered us and giving me the chance to have the second life, to live in dignity, and to fulfill my wishes. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for your interview. And thank you, Carlton University, for giving me the opportunity to share my real life story and to participate in this meaningful project. You're very welcome. Thank you. I think the most important I'd like to show you is the picture of the captain. When I uh, uh, wrote him, when I first came to Canada, because uh, when he said that he had to take us himself to the refugee camp, so I asked him to give me a chance uh, to be uh, in contact when I am resettled in the third country. So he gave me a piece of uh, paper written, uh, handwritten um, with his own handwriting, you know, so written by himself. So. so this is my savior and my most earnest wish in the last years of my life is to have the opportunity to express my infinite gratitude uh, to him for his rescue, a debt that can never be repaid. And this is the, the piece of paper given to me when I asked for the, his, um, a chance to be in contact. And this is um, my benefactor who sponsored me to embark on that uh, horrific but miraculous trip. It's a faithful, faithful trip, faithful boat. And uh, at the camp, I, so my trip was uh, just like uh, my, my, my beloved aunt uh, who supported my family. Now she already dead, but uh, to her spirit, I would like to express my deepest gratitude for her love, for her support when my mother died. And she was a cellist in the Hanoi National uh, Symphony Orchestra. So she was, so that's why she had the chance to come to Saigon a short time after April 30th. And this is uh, my picture when I was about to leave. Uh, no, no, in the, uh, so uh, when I was in Saigon before I, before I left to be on the trip. And at the refugee camp, I worked as an interpreter. So I, I had the chance 
um, so this is the letter of the one the, um, so I think uh, one uh, commissioner wrote uh, this letter to invite me to a party when we were about to leave uh, the Pulau, uh, the Sunga BC, yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is a letter, did you? Uh, and uh, this is uh, the card certified that I was an interpreter at the Pura Vido. And this is uh, a group of people who's on the same boat, on the faithful boat. And uh, Kang was the photographer, so at that time, uh, we, so he's not in here. But uh, he, this is uh, Can I your husband? No, the man, the young man who shouted, who said, well, you in, uh, 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 the English teacher, why don't you come up to talk to the captain to rescue us? Because uh, at that time, I didn't know him, you know, but he was told to look for me, so that's why he yelled out loudly. So, that, uh, so that's why we, people uh, carried me. And uh, so the man in this, the, on the same boat, uh, and in 1988, uh, he is my, my husband. And his uh, integration journey also very interesting because he was on his own after two months coming to Canada, arriving in Canada. And his first job was uh, just like a, a cleaner at the Maple Leaf Garden. And 10 years later, after coming back to school, after doing different jobs like sofa maker, so he came back to his uh, career before he, he, because he was an electrical engineer in Vietnam. He came back to U of T and t 12 years later he became the director of electrical department of uh, LKM, which is a branch of uh, SNC Lavalin, who the company's, uh, yeah. Do you see the man in, four, in, in blue? Uh, in the blue. Uh, Standing up? Is he the man standing up? In the blue? Yes, standing up in the blue T-shirt, right? A polo shirt, in the blue polo shirt. So on this, at that time, I didn't know him, you know. But uh, this Sunga BC, after we were accepted uh, by Canada, and and on the same boat, we, we became uh, acquaintances because uh, we had to do everything at the same time, uh, according to the rule of the of the camp. Uh, they give you the, I, my number is MB224, so everybody on the same boat has the same number. And that number have to go to the post office, to the uh, conference hall, to do the paper, all at the same time. So that's why we became uh, knowing each other, you know, acquaintances. And the either can show you the picture of... Uh, my family in Vietnam before 1975. These are the two pictures of my, me and my older sister who worked as a reporter for Saigon Broadcasting Station uh, after 1972 because uh, she finished the uh, university in 1970 and became a secondary school teacher. So this is uh, me and her. and. Uh, and this is her picture when she worked as a reporter at Saigon Broadcasting Station. And did you see my aunt? You did. And... Uh, Can you show us your um, clothing? Oh, yes. So, my... I have something I keep uh, as a very meaningful, very precious, even though many people think I'm crazy, because this is the outfit I wore when I left Vietnam to be on the faithful trip. Horrific, yet miraculous and faithful, eventful and faithful. And this is the shirt made by myself when I learned how to make, because uh, when I lost my job, uh, after 19, 
after 75, I couldn't get a job as a teacher, right? Because it's the, my education was garbage at that time. But uh, in 1978, after that, when Vietnam had uh, uh, a lot of uh, people uh, had the, the movement or the wave of uh, cross-border escape, so English was in great demand. So I could earn my living by teaching English. So, and after that, I couldn't, and so I learned how to make clothes. So this is the first, first shirt made by myself, and I wore it on the faithful trip. And I keep it. And this is the, the pair. It looks so terrible because uh, I sat uh, many days on the boat. So it's completely damaged, you know, but uh, and looks really very t terrible. But uh, I just like uh, my memories. And this is uh, the, the cardigan given t to me uh, when I was a refugee at the at Sunga BC, when I was about to leave uh, for Canada, so I so I wore it on the airplane, and when I got off the airplane to walk to the office of the immigration office in Montreal, I felt the bone chilling cold, even though it was April tenth, nineteen eighty five, but I felt the bone chilling cold, you know with this so and i want to keep it as a very meaningful memory okay thank you very much but you're very welcome my honor and my pleasure to share with you my silly things